Robinson. He even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. I uh, wanted to reach out and say thank you guys for all the listens, all the love. We see it on social media, we see it on YouTube. It has been sensational. And we want to encourage you guys, if you guys are enjoying the podcast and liking it, that you guys subscribe and like it, uh, whether it's on YouTube, on our UCLA LAFB channel, or the Bruin Bible, uh, to subscribe either through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, however you guys listen and react to it, because it's going to allow us to do much greater things in the future. We're creators. We want to be giving the best Bruins content to all of our UCLA listeners. The only way we can do that is if we have a fan base that is locked in and helping us out. So we appreciate you guys. We love you guys. If you guys have been liking it, please help us out with a like and subscribe. Man, what is up, Bruin Bible listeners? We are officially Pac-12 after dark when it comes to recording a podcast. I've got work tomorrow, but somehow got roped into an 11 p.m. start time on this podcast. Will Decker, host of the Bruin Bible. To your right, my co-host, Mr. Madman, Jamal Madney, my friend, your favorite. Man, it's nice to come back off of a victory after these last two losses in the last previous three games to tough opponents in Oregon State and Utah. But, man, UCLA came out there and put on a great showing against Stanford. It was like watching a knife slice through hot butter, man, man. It was beautiful to watch. It was carefree. It was easy. The game felt like it was over, you know, five to ten minutes into the ball game. It was so stress-free and fun to watch. And that's where we got to start, man. Ethan Garbers, you know, he had every right to essentially quit on this team after losing the starting job, after being the veteran. But, man, he swallowed his pride, and he played phenomenally well. And, you know, just 20 of 28 through the air, 240 yards, two touchdowns. Used his legs a lot. You know, eight carries for 51 yards were the final tallies. Scored on his first three, three of his first four drives, and it would have been four straight had Lopez's field goal not gotten blocked. So, I mean – he was just moving the ball at will. I know it was Stanford, but I was just so impressed given everything he's been through, given the way that he lost the starting position earlier in the year where you saw his confidence kind of just falter against Coastal Carolina in the opening game. I think this is a logical place to start, man. Talk to me about what you saw from Ethan Garbers and how effective he was in moving the offense for UCLA and leading us to a victory to get our season back on track. Well, absolutely. I think it's it's the ideal place to start. And first of all, I got to say thank you for obliging my my 11 p.m. start time here tonight, Thriller. See, this is what happens when you ask an Indian to pick the start time on a Sunday night. This is what happens. You, you, you get the Bible after dark here. Uh, but I digress in, in terms of, uh, you know, I'm just so proud of, of Ethan Garbers. It would have been so easy for him to read the writing on the wall and say, I got beaten out by a true freshman, 18 year old. It's really not going to happen for me here. I'm just going to kind of go through the motions and mentally start preparing myself for transferring to another university next year. But no way would Ethan Garbers have it that way. Continue to come into the office every day, prepared, ready for his number to be called. And just a very impressive outing. Will I think He's been the ultimate game manager in this particular ball game, which is exactly what UCLA needs moving forward, given that stout defense. And I think there's three elements here, Will, and you touched on a few of them, where he really shined. The first was, I think, the mobile element. You mentioned the eight carries for 51 yards, and that does a couple of things. It preserves the quarterback as a running threat on the RPOs. And so defenses aren't just going to crash onto Carson Steele or TJ Harden or whoever the running back may be. They have to honor the keeper. And I think that allowed this offense to really generate momentum, particularly early in the game. But it also allows you, when you have a mobile quarterback, when things break down in terms of coverage, in terms of the pass rush, for you to roll out buy time for either a check down or a better throw or just scramble yourself and get some yards. So I think his mobility, number one, 
was a dimension that stood out. Number two, Will, was I think his willingness to check the ball down. When you look at the 20 for 28, the 240 yards and the two touchdowns, that's 8.6 yards per attempt, which tells you he's really looking at the underneath stuff. And he found it in terms of Loya. J. Michael Sturdivant was running shorter routes. He found Mataveo on, on the one touchdown. He found Habermill on about a 12-yard run that Habermill turned into a 45-yarder. He found Kyle Ford underneath, and Kyle Ford turned things around with some real nice yards after the catch. So I think his willingness to look underneath and really rely on that check down game to complement the running game, I think was absolutely significant. And then third, and most importantly, he was clean sheet in terms of turnovers. And this team was clean sheet, and that's what we were looking for. And so I think A, mobility, B, the willingness to check down, and C, protecting the ball at all costs. If UCLA gets those three things from their quarterback as just being a game manager and you allow that running game to do its thing and you allow that defense to be nasty, this is an old school type of team. Run the ball, play great defense, and then have timely quarterback play in terms of the right situations. And I think Ethan Garbers seems to be the perfect positional player right now for this particular team's identity. And, you know, just how he was able to spread around the football. We had five players with three or more catches. You know, that's the most we've had all season long. You know, getting involved, your Sturdivants, it seemed like he was kind of quiet, you know, for a couple weeks there. Five catches, 54 yards, the touchdown you mentioned. Had that beautiful manipulation with his eyes on that Hudson Habermill play yes. that went for 45 yards. Kyle Ford, I mean, you've been talking about him for weeks now. He finally got the shine. He had a big-time play on that 37-yard completion to Kyle Ford. Loya was involved, as always, and Josiah Norwood with five catches. So it just seemed like he was just peppering the ball around. He felt like he was in total control of the offense, which is you know something we just haven't seen. And it kind of takes you back to an alternative. What if he doesn't throw that pick six in the end zone, you know, against Coastal Carolina on the second drive of the game where first drive he moved the ball at will, touchdown, but you could just see it, man. Some people, they make a mistake and their confidence just evaporates. And that was the case in that game for Ethan Garbers. I think Garbers would actually give you a similar answer. You know, what would have happened if that was the case? And, I mean, you touched on it, man, before I give it back to you. Garbers gave such a good answer, you know, when Ben Bolch asked him in the article. He goes, you know, I thought about quitting. I thought about doing all this, but, you know, you never know what can happen, you know, when you get your chance and really made the most of his chance. You know, I, I loved what I saw, but, you know, to kind of, you know, go back to the question I was referring to, what happens if Garbers, you know, doesn't throw that pick in the end zone? Is UCLA an undefeated team right now? Oh, well, Will, it's a great question because you've got a seasoned quarterback, uh, you know, at, at, at the helm. I do think sometimes it's it's hard to play those what if games because when you're on the road, you do need to make a play to be able to win some road games. And I think Garbers, while is such a seasoned quarterback and makes the right decisions, you wonder sometimes about that upside of, of being able to make some great plays on the road. I think it's a phenomenal question. To me, Will, I think the corollary to that question is this was a smooth game. He had no adversity. I think we're looking at a world where he's presumably going to be the starter against Colorado next week. What happens if and when he does throw an interception or makes a mistake? Does his confidence now, given the experience that he's been through of sitting on the bench, watching the team, understanding what they need from a leadership standpoint, understanding what they exactly need from the quarterback position, does he evolve and become more resilient moving forward, even to overcome those mistakes? And so I'm, I'm somewhat curious to see that because obviously when the game is going well, it's very easy to get into a rhythm, to feel very positive, to continue to sort of use it as a domino effect to do even more things well. But what happens when you sort of make a mistake? Can you reset and be resilient and then just pick up right where you left off? I believe he can. I believe he's grown. And I think even if there's a glitch next week, potentially, I think he's going to be able to put it behind him. And now he's got a body of work with this particular team. And he's got the trust of this team's locker room, which he had even in the spring. I mean, there was obviously, Will, we understood the type of leader he was, the type of respect he commanded in that huddle in the spring and in the fall. But now he's put some body of work together. He's got a win under his belt. 
And what I also loved, Will, on your last point is how he was building rapport with multiple players. And the fact that it didn't feel like there was a true number one out there. You talked about the five different players with three plus catches, but nobody had more than 54 yards receiving. So that's a very different feeling, right? even as a receiver, when you're running routes and saying, hey, I have as good a chance as anybody else to get the ball on this particular play. This is an equal opportunity offense. And Garbers is really just going to look for the open man, make the simple play, make the correct play. So, Will, you know, it's, it's an incredible game of what if, if he were the quarterback this whole time. But I think we still have everything in front of us to be able to accomplish our goals. And I think we're going to have a better Ethan Garbers moving forward than we did at the start of this season. Yeah. And, I, you know, I went back and listened to some of our early podcasts before the season started. And just to say, I mean... I was on the Garbers train. Yes, you were. A lot of people were. And I know everyone wanted Dante and Dante. It kind of played out exactly, you know, how we were talking about it, where the freshman gets in and he makes those freshman mistakes. And you kind of want just the smooth sailing. He may not have the ceiling of some of the throws that Dante can make, but the guy just operates in a different way. And the thing that I was impressed with, and I don't want to, you know, steer the listeners in a wrong way. Stanford does not, frankly, have a great defense. You know, I think that's a factual statement after what we saw. But every time a play broke down, there was no panic. He made the right decision, and he got the ball out. No turnovers. That cannot be understated from what we've seen from Dante these past couple weeks where it clearly was in his head. You know, the three opening drive turnovers on interceptions, the three pick sixes, those are just plays that can't happen if you're trying yes. to make a team. And, you know, I love Dante. I'm excited for the Dante era. I don't want this to come off as anti-Dante. But for this team, you know, to reach its ceiling, I think Ethan Garbers is the guy moving forward. I think we got to stick with Garbers as the quarterback for UCLA. Do you think he's got to be the quarterback moving forward for the rest of the year after that performance? Well, you know, it's it's a it's a great question, and I I agree with you. And if you recall this time last week, Will, when we were kind of breaking down the Oregon State game, it feels like a you know feels like a year ago, but it was only a, a a week ago. And remember, I had mentioned to you that hey, maybe this is could be an opportunity for. Dante to sit at yeah. least for this week given just how physically and emotionally and mentally he looked battered at the end of that game I mean he's taken a beating at Utah at Oregon State there is an argument to be made to say hey listen he went through the gauntlet the tough games why don't you give him an easy game to sort of recover his confidence you know and 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 sort of allow him to kind of get back on this trajectory but I think Chip made the absolute right call because I think Dante needs to recharge a little bit, build a little bit more endurance, both physically and mentally and emotionally of this being his first college season. And I think this team needed a bit of a fresh voice, a fresh style of play and a fresh signal caller. And I think given now, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it, the larger implications of what's to come. And when you look at what's ahead, in terms of this schedule, I believe the two toughest games are now behind them. They are in a position to be able to win out. With that defense and that running game, all you're asking your quarterback to do is manage the game, manage time, score, situation, and not make mistakes. Because this year is such an anomaly for UCLA football where a punt is not a bad thing. You know, the bad thing is the sudden change, the turnovers, the pick sixes, really compromising your defense. Garbers gives this team the best opportunity to win out moving forward. And then you're in a position where the future is just so, so bright with Dante Moore. So I completely agree with you. I think it's Garbers' team now into the foreseeable future, unless Chip is given a reason to make a change with evidence on the field, this has to be Garbers moving forward. I agree. I think Garbers has to be the guy moving forward. Doesn't mean Dante can't be the starter next year with more experience. No or question. Maybe we work him in with more. I mean, he came in off the bench and showed some flashes. I think he was four of five through the air for 26 yards. Did some nice things at the quarterback spot. But let's talk about the run game. You mentioned the run game and the defense. Let's go right there. It was a certain running back's birthday on Saturday, turning 21 years old, Carson Steele. And I can't think of a better way for a running back to celebrate than three first half touchdowns, 20 carries, 76 yards. Typical Carson Steele game, man, just a battering ram, 20 carries, 3.8 yards per carry. Not those long runs, but man, he just bullies people. That 13 yard run, you may remember there's one linebacker in the way, 
and he just knocked him on his ass and went for three or four more <laughs> yards. It was a beautiful sight for a football fan that loves it. I think this guy, you know, could be a fullback in the NFL if he put his mind to it. There's a lot to like there with Carson Steele and the three touchdowns. He's becoming a fan favorite, and he's doing a lot of great things for UCLA. Talk to me about UCLA's tailback because he balled once again for UCLA. Well, he was absolutely terrific, just very solid with, with the 20 carries. And, and you mentioned the, the 76 yards, the three touchdowns, just methodical down the field. I think what was very telling for me, Will, is Chip's emphasis on identity in this game. Because by going to Garbers, and we talked about the game management element, he is picking an identity of who he wants for his quarterback. But he also doubled down in terms of identity for his running back. Because in a game like this, when you're a 17 and a half point favorite, you ultimately win the game by 35 points. You've ultimately shut this team out in Stanford for the vast majority of the game. This would sort of be an ideal game to give maybe Carson Steele nine or 10 carries, give TJ Harden maybe 12 or 15 carries, give Keegan Jones 10 to 12 carries, give Colson Yankoff eight to 10 carries, give Anthony Atkins six to eight carries, and really sort of pepper it around. Uh Uh-uh. Chip said, my workhorse is my workhorse. This is the third straight game now for Carson Steele to cross 20 carries, Will, which is, I think, deeply significant. And I think message has been sent by Chip Kelly that my running game is going to be built around the power of Carson Steele. I've got a couple change of pace guys in Harden and Keegan Jones when I need it. But the bread and butter of this team is going to be Carson Steele running the ball, and Ethan Garber's game managing my pass game and allowing my defense to shine. And Carson Steele is just such an ideal compliment, Will, to this team this year because of his methodical approach to running the ball, his ability to stay physical. Let me ask you this, Will. When was the last time you saw Carson Steele go out of bounds this season? I mean, he is a guy, he's going to, you know, sort of dig his heels in. He's going to cut it inside. He's an in-between Uh, the hash marks type of runner, inside runner. You're going to chew the clock. You're going to get a lot of plays in. You're going to control time of possession. And that's the running back that Chip Kelly really wants. He's perfect for this system. Does he have the explosiveness of a Zach Charbonnet? No. Does he have the breakaway speed of a Demetric Felton? No. But what he does have is a durability and an ability to absorb contact and always fall forward and always seem to be the individual that is infusing the punishment, not receiving it. And Carson Steele is not just becoming a crowd favorite. I think he is a crowd favorite, and I think he's the centerpiece of this offense. And I just love this team, Will. This is an ode to old-school Big Ten football. This is Woody Hayes, Bo Schembechler, old-school Joe Paterno type of Big Ten football here. And Carson Steele is just the leading man in this offense and doing such a phenomenal job. Yeah, I mean, we look like a Big Ten team, no doubt about it, across the board, the tough defense, the tough run game, everything else. I want to know if you agree with this theory that I have with Chip Kelly using Carson Steele as much as he is. Who's Carson Steele? The majority of his carries traditionally come in the first half and maybe some in the late, you know, early second half, if you will. I think he uses Carson Steele to wear out the defense because it takes like three or four guys to tackle this guy. He is just strong and tough. And by the end of it, you're bruised up. You're feeling it too, just as much as Carson Steele is taking on those hits. And then right when the defense kind of adjusts to kind of his slow, methodical three to four yards, he'll bring out a TJ Harden for that 22-yard touchdown run that he had. Or remember Keegan Jones when he had those two kind of breakaway runs against Washington State. Do you agree that there may be some strategy here with using steel kind of as a slower, more methodical, and then right when the defense isn't expecting it, he'll bring in the top end speed and the defense has no answer for it? Well, I completely agree with you. And I think it's the thing that we were talking about since that Washington State game when we had Wayne Cook on. And remember when we talked about order matters. It's not just about running the ball. It's the order in which who runs the ball that really matters. And we talked that game about Steele being that first half, that first part of the game thumper to then open things up for TJ Harden to hit that home run. And that ended up being, of course, the Keegan Jones game as we have coined it. I totally agree with you. This is all about wearing down the defense with tremendous body blows. This offense resembles a great Rocky film 
where Rocky's in there against Ivan Drago and going body blow, body blow, body blow, and just enduring the rounds. And then by 12th, 13th, 14th round, that opposing defense is so worn down with the body blows that they just cannot get their arms around these speedsters. And when you change the pace of the game, they just lose contain in terms of angles, and it's just such a sudden jolt. And I think this thunder and lightning combination where it's thunder first, then lightning, I think is the recipe for success for UCLA. And I also thought, Will, it was fitting that he didn't play Keegan Jones against Stanford because he knew he didn't really need him. And so I think he's really keeping Keegan Jones in that back pocket of this is my guy that I'm going to find five to seven touches for over the course of a game, but he's going to be my game breaker. Obviously, Harden's going to come in, be the change of pace with a smooth running, but I got five to seven plays. You know, old school Michigan brought Charles Woodson in for five or seven plays to be that home run hitter. These great off, these great defense. Dion used to come in with the Cowboys and the Niners, five to seven plays to kind of t- turn up the offense. And I think this is what that Keegan Jones role is going to be when you wear down this defense with steel and then you bring in that change of pace. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, Keegan Jones, man. Still would like to see more of him. Didn't even get a touch last game. It was. Tough to see. I love Keegan Jones, so maybe saving him for a big role this upcoming weekend. When Dion comes to the Rose Bowl, that's going to be a lot of fun out there in Pasadena. Last point I'm going to bring is the defense, man. Defense has been special. You know, and per Ben Bolch's article he just put up, we're giving up about 14.9 points a game through seven games this season. That is the fewest amount of points per game we have given up in over 30 years. It is uh, 1988 was the last time we had given that up. And we talked about our, you know, pregame players of the week. And one player that we both touched upon was Gabriel Murphy, man. Was two sacks, two tackles for a loss. Liatu Latu had a sack fumble turned over by a holding call. And then he goes out and sacks again the quarterback for Stanford and Ashton Daniels. Defensive line's been special this year. Seven tackles for a loss. You know, front seven is about as good as I can remember as a UCLA fan. Talk to me about this defense because there's a toughness, there's a relentlessness that we just have not seen under Chip Kelly, and it's really making the difference for UCLA this year. Will, what I love about this defense, and you've talked about it, toughness, there's a discipline, there's a physicality, there's a willingness for contact, there's there's a willingness to get your hands dirty and really make terrific plays, both vertically as well as horizontally. I think what I love about this team more than anything else defensively is they just don't take any plays off. Every play, especially with that front seven, is just relentless pressure and relentless containment. And I think De'Anton Lynn has just dialed up this defense so perfectly where they're just so focused play over play. You have everything that you need with that front seven, Will, when you talk about the pass rushing capabilities of Latu and the Murphy twins, when you talk about the athleticism and the ranginess of a Muasau and an Oladija, when you talk about that interior toughness of a Toya and a Keanu Williams, you just have so much. And then you've got veteran leadership and sort of a do-it-all linebacker in Kane Madrana, who also played quite well against Stanford. And so what I saw was it would have been so easy for this team to be able to take a day a night off knowing that they had kind of an inferior team coming in and knowing that their running game was was really clicking they were able to score early and often many times you see a heavy favorite give up some some points give up some yards because they don't want to risk injury they don't want to get banged up in a game like this but not UCLA I mean to be able to pitch a shutout deep into the second half and really ultimately only give up seven points. It just shows the pride that they take in their craft, that that 14.9 points per game allowed really means something to them deeply, and giving up as few yards as possible means something to them very, very deeply. The ability to get an interception, our man Humphrey came through again with a terrific interception late in that game, means something to them very deeply. And when you have a defense that has now solidified themselves as the leaders of this team, where everything begins and ends with anchoring, knowing that you're not going to be able to give up that many points in any particular game and you allow patience for your running game and you allow patience for your game-managing quarterback, that identity and just having it so crystal clear is so paramount. 
And it all starts with this front seven, Will. There's been a few other front sevens that maybe were as talented, perhaps even slightly more talented when you think about kind of the Anthony Barr years, when you think with Kendricks, when you think Miles Jack, when you go back even 2006 with the likes of Brigham Harwell, Brian Price, you know, there's some comparable front sevens there and particularly front fours, but there was no defense in my lifetime that I recall is just so much in unison, has so much continuity that plays off of one, one another so well and is so consistent. To me, this is the best defense that I have ever seen UCLA have in my lifetime. And we're going to ride this defense as long as they're willing to take us on the ride. And I believe it's going to be very far. I think it can be very far as well. I think we have probably four first-team All-Pac-12 defenders, if you count Latu. I think we got to put Gabriel Murphy up there right Yes, now. we do. He's been outstanding. I've seen mock drafts where he's moved up to maybe the third round in the NFL draft for what he's been able to do. I got Muwasa out there, kind of the captain of the defense. And then the unsung hero – Got a blocked punt, Alex Johnson, this week. Alex Johnson has been outstanding. Leads he has. Receptions, makes play after play each week. He's got to be on there as a defensive back, so there's four guys. You kind of alluded to with your answer, man. We're 5-2 and two as it stands. The Pac-12 has a lot of good teams playing other teams left. It can be very messy at the end of this. Do you think UCLA has a good chance of maybe running the table and giving themselves a chance? when they go for the Pac-12 championship, if they can. Because the games they have left are Colorado, Arizona. I mean, Arizona's going to be a dogfight. I don't want to say that. Arizona beat us last year. Their offense looked great. They nearly beat USC in the Coliseum a couple weeks ago. They're a talented team. After that, we got Arizona State. We got USC and Cal. So if we run the table, we win those five games. We go 10-2. and Is there a chance we can do it? You know, Washington still has to play Washington State. Oregon still has to play Oregon State. USC has to play Washington and Oregon. You know, who knows? A lot of good things can happen for UCLA if they just take care of what they can control. Well, I I think you said it really well. There's a couple of tricky games here with Colorado can be tricky at times, given Shadur Sanders, a lot of explosive receivers. You alluded a road trip to Tucson can always get a little bit dicey. Arizona is very much Jekyll and Hyde this year. And then obviously you got the victory bell game and then the game with Cal afterwards. To me, I believe this team is going to run the table. They are going to win their last five games. I think they're better than everybody else that they are going to play from here on out. I saw USC uh, basically get punked by Utah, Will, and this is a team that is soft. So I think UCLA has to come in with the right mindset to say, we are the better team. We are the more physical team. We have to impose our brand of ball. And it's about getting Garbers ready for for the ebbs and flows of having a rivalry game on the road. But to me, Will, when you look at this Pac-12, it's about a four-horse race right now, today. When you think about Oregon, Washington, Oregon State, and Utah, and when you look ahead, all four of them, have to play the other three with some permutation. It begins this upcoming week. Oregon is going to Utah. The game day crew with ESPN is going to be there. This is their third trip to the West Coast for game day, uh, representing the Pac-12. There is going to definitely be a scenario where we are going to have multiple two-loss teams in this conference. There's probably only going to be one team that's going to survive this gauntlet, either being undefeated or with one loss. And so I just love so much where UCLA is right now. The national attention is all on what Penix can do and right now what Caleb can't do and how Dan Lanning and Bo Nix are going to respond and what Oregon State being the Cinderella without having a conference, can they win the conference and sort of become America's team? There's all of these storylines around these four teams and all UCLA needs to do is keep their head down, put one foot in front of the other, and just take care of their business. Fly under the radar. Even in Los Angeles, all the storylines are about USC and what they are and what they aren't. And they have a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and a $100 million coach and all of the things where they've underachieved. And this guy's a lion and this guy's a sheep and this guy's a choker and this guy's not a competitor. And all of these things are going around. And all UCLA has to do, they're in a perfect position 
Keep your head down. Just keep working. You have the horses in the stable to get to the dance. If this team goes 5-0 and the rest of the way, gets to 10-2, and gets to 7-2 and in the conference, I believe they will have the conference tiebreakers necessary to get that number two spot and make it to the Pac-12 championship game. And what a fitting story it would be where the team across town has all this high-priced hubris And in the year when they were supposed to be the greatest team in America and a team that was going to win the national championship, no question about it, that it's the good guys. It's the other guys from Westwood, the the school with the values, the school with the pedigree, the school that does everything right is going to steal the Pac-12 championship from them all. I believe in my heart that can happen. And I know this defense does too. And I know Chip Kelly does too. And now it's just a matter of putting five games together And boy, oh boy, this Bruin Nation fans deserve it so much, and we're going to get it. Wow, it's 11.35 on a Sunday night. I feel like I could run through a wall right now after hearing that. UCLA fans, the season is far from over. We've got more than enough on our plate to have a chance to crack at the Pac-12 title game. Will Decker, Jamal Madney, we're signing off for the Bruin Bible here on Sunday nights. We will be back this week with a game preview Stick around for more. UCLA is back on track, man. It's a beautiful sign, and we wish you guys nothing but a great start to your week. Talk to you guys soon, and have a great rest of your evening.